Welcome to RLP Audiobooks channel, the channel that brings forgotten books back to life, in audio format, so you can listen to whenever and wherever you desire, whether you're driving, chilling, and even sleeping. Please consider subscribing to the channel, and click the notifications button, so you don't miss out on any other videos. Now, relax, listen, ponder, and enjoy. Surah 33. Al-Azab. Context. Period of Revelation. The Surah discusses three important events, which are, the Battle of the Trench, or Al-Azab, which took place in the month of Shawwal, five after Hijra. The raid on Banu Karatha, which was made in Zulkaida, five after Hijra and the Prophet's marriage with Zainab, which also was contracted in Zulkaida, 5 after Hijra. These historical events, accurately determine the period of the revelation of this surah. The Historical Background The Islamic armies set back in the Battle of Uhud, 3 after Hijra, that resulted from the error of the archers, appointed by the Prophet, so boosted up the morale, of the Arab pagans the Jews, and the hypocrites, that they started entertaining the hope, that they would soon be able to exterminate Islam and the Muslims, completely. Their high state of morale, can be judged from the events that occurred in the first year after Uhud. Hardly two months had passed, then the tribe of Bani Asad of Najd, began to make preparations for a raid on Medina, and the Prophet had to dispatch an expedition under Abu Salama to counteract them. In Safar 4 after Hijra, some people of the tribes of Adal and Kara asked the Prophet to send some men to instruct them in Islam. Accordingly, six of the companions were allowed to accompany them for the purpose. But when they reached Raji, a place between Rabig and Jeddah, they summoned Hudail against them, who killed four of the companions and took the other two, Hubayb bin Adi, and Zaid bin Adathina, to Mecca, and sold them to the enemy. Then in the same month of Safar, on the request of a chief of Bani Amir, the Prophet sent another deputation of forty, according to others seventy, preachers, consisting of the Ansar young men, to Najd. But they were also betrayed. The people of Usaya, Real, and Dakwan, tribes of Bani Sulaim, surrounded them suddenly at, Biramauna, and slew all of them. Meanwhile, the Jewish tribe of Banu Nadir of Medina, getting encouragement, continued to commit breaches of the treaties, so much so that in Rabi al Awal, 4 after Hijra, they plotted against the life of the Prophet himself. Then in Jamadi al Ula, 4 after Hijra, Bani Thalba and Bani Maharib, the two tribes of Banu Ghatafan, started making preparations to attack Medina, and the Prophet had to go to punish them. Thus, after their setback at Uhud, the Muslims went on encountering repercussions, continuously for seven to eight months. However, it was the Prophet's determination and wisdom, and his great companion spirit of sacrifice, that changed these adverse conditions completely, within a short span of time. The economic boycott by the Arabs, had made life hard for the people of Medina. All the polytheistic tribes around Medina were becoming rebellious. Inside Medina itself, the Jews, and the hypocrites, were bent upon mischief. But the successive steps taken by a handful of the sincere Muslims, under the leadership of the Prophet, not only restored the image of strength of Islam in Arabia, but also increased it manifold. Raids preceding the Battle of the Trench The first such step was taken immediately after the Battle of Uhud. The very next day when quite a large number of Muslims lay wounded, and the martyrdom of the near and dear ones was being mourned in many houses, and the Prophet himself was injured, and sat at the martyrdom of his uncle Hamza, he called out to the devoted servants of Islam, to accompany him in pursuit of the pagans, so as to deter them from returning and attacking Medina again. The Prophet's assessment was absolutely correct. 
He knew that although the Quraysh had retreated, without taking any advantage of their almost complete victory, they would certainly regret their folly, when they would halt, consider the whole matter calmly on the way, and would return to attack Medina again. Therefore, he decided to go in pursuit of them, and 630 of the Muslims at once, volunteered to accompany him. When they reached Hamra al-Assad, on the way to Mecca, and camped there for three days, the Prophet came to know through a sympathetic non-Muslim, that Abu Sufyan had stayed at, Aroha, 36 miles short of Medina, with an army 2,978 strong, they were regretting their error, and were in fact, planning to return and attack Medina once again. But when they heard, that the Prophet was coming in pursuit of them with an army, they lost heart and gave up their plan. Thus, not only were the Quraysh deterred by this action, but the other enemies living around Medina, also realized that the Muslims were being led by a person, who was highly well informed, wise, and resolute, and that the Muslims were ever ready to lay down their lives at his command. Then as soon as the Bani Asad, started making preparations for a raid on Medina, the Prophet's secret agents gave him timely information about their intention. Thus, before they could come in force to attack Medina, he sent an army of 150 strong, under Abu Salama, the first husband of Umm Salama, to punish them. They took Bani Asad by surprise, who fled in panic, leaving all their possessions behind, which fell into the Muslim hands. After this, came the turn of the Banu Nadir. The day they plotted against the life of the Prophet, and the secret, was disclosed, the Prophet ordered them to leave Medina within ten days, and warned that anyone who remained behind after that, would be put to death. Abdullah bin Ubayi, the chief of the hypocrites of Medina, encouraged them to defy the order, and refused to leave Medina. He even promised to help them with two thousand men, and assured them that the Banu Ghatafan from Najd, also would come to their aid. Accordingly, the Banu Nadir, sent word that they would not leave, no matter what the Prophet might do. As soon as the time limit of ten days came to an end, the Prophet laid siege to their quarters, but none of their supporters had the courage to come to their rescue. At last they surrendered, on condition that every three of them would be allowed to load a camel, with whatever they could carry, and go away leaving the rest of their possessions behind. Thus, the whole suburbs of the city, which were inhabited by the Banu Nadir, and their gardens, their fortresses, and other properties fell to the Muslims, and the people of this treacherous tribe became scattered in Khyber, Wad il Qura, and Syria. Then the Prophet turned his attention to the Banu Ghatafan, who were preparing for a war against Medina. He took 400 of the Muslims, and overtook them at, Zad Arika. They were so taken by surprise, that they fled their houses without a struggle, and took refuge in the mountains. After this, in Chaban, for after Hijra, the Prophet went forth to Butter, to fight Abu Sufyan. At the end of the Battle of, Uhud, he had challenged the Prophet and the Muslims, saying, We shall again meet you in combat, at Butter next year. In reply the Prophet announced through a companion, All right, we accept your challenge. Accordingly, at the appointed time he reached Butter, with 1500 of the Muslims. From the other side, Abu Sufyan left Mecca with an army of 2,000 men, but could not have the courage to march beyond, Meraz Zaran, modern Wadi Fatima. The Prophet waited for him at Butter for eight days. The Muslims during these days, did profitable business with a trading party. This incident helped more than restore the image of strength of the Muslims, that had been tarnished at, Uhud. It also made the whole of Arabia realize, that the Quraysh alone could no longer resist Muhammad. This image and position of the Muslims was further strengthened by another event. Dhamad al-Jandal Modern, al jauf was an important place at the border between Arabia and Syria. When the caravans of the Arabs, trading between Iraq in the south, and Syria and Egypt in the north, passed that way, they were harassed and looted by the natives. 
In Rabi al Oil, 5 after Hijra, the Prophet himself went to punish them with an army of 1,000 men. They could not muster up courage to come out and fight him, and therefore fled the place. This caused the whole of northern Arabia to dread the power of Islam. And the tribes began to realize that the great power emerging from Medina was formidable and could no longer be resisted by one or a few of the tribes. The Battle of the Trench. Such were the conditions when the Battle of the Trench took place. It was in fact, a combined raid by many of the Arab tribes, who wanted to crush the power of Medina. It had been instigated by the leaders of the Bandanad here, who had settled in Khyber, after their banishment from Medina. They went round to the Quraysh, Gatafon, Hudayl, and many other tribes, and induced them to gather all their forces together and attack Medina jointly. Thus, in Shawal, five after Hijra, an unprecedentedly large army of the Arab tribes, marched against the small city of Medina. From the north, came Jews of Banu Nadhir, and Bani Kainuka, who after their banishment from Medina, had settled in Khyber, and Wad Okura. From the east, advanced the tribes of Gatafon, Bani Sulaim, Fazara, Mara, Ashia, Sadasad, etc. And from the south, the Quraysh along with a large force of their allies. Together they numbered from 10 to 12,000 men. Had it been a sudden attack, it would have been disastrous. But the Prophet was not unaware of this in Medina. His intelligence men, and the sympathizers of the Islamic movement, and the people influenced by it, were present in every tribe who kept him informed of the enemy's movements. Even before the enemy could reach his city, he got a trench dug out, on the northwest of Medina in six days, and took up a defensive position with 3,000 men in the protection of the trench. To the south of Medina, there were many gardens, even now there are, so that it could not be attacked from that side. To the east, there are lava rocks which are impassable for a large army. The same is the case with the southwestern side. The attack therefore, could be made only from the eastern and western sides of the Uhud, which the Prophet had secured by digging a trench. The disbelievers were not at all aware, that they would have to counter the trench, outside Medina. This kind of a defensive strategy was unknown to the Arabs. Thus, they had to lay a long siege in winter, for which they had not come prepared. After this, only one alternative remained with the disbelievers. To incite the Jewish tribe of Banu Karatha, who inhabited the southeastern part of the city, to rebellion. As the Muslims had entered a treaty with them, that in case of an attack on Medina, they would defend the city, along with them. The Muslims had made no defensive arrangement there, and had even sent their families, to take shelter in the fort situated on that side. The invaders perceived this weakness of the Islamic defenses. They sent, Huyay bin Aktab, the Jewish leader of the Banu Nadhir, to the Banu Karatha, so as to induce them to break the treaty and join the war. In the beginning they refused to oblige, and said that they had a treaty with Muhammad, who had faithfully abided by it, and given them no cause for complaint. But when Ibn Aktab, said to them, Look! I have summoned the united force of entire Arabia against him. This is a perfect opportunity to get rid of him. If you lose it, you will never have another opportunity. The anti-Islamic Jewish mind, prevailed over every mortal consideration, and the Banu Karatha, were persuaded to break the treaty. The Prophet received news of this. He at once told Sa'd bin Ubada, Sa'd bin Mu'az, Abdullah bin Rawaha, and Hawat bin Jubair, chiefs of the Ansar, to go and find out the truth. He advised them that if they found Banu Karatha, still loyal to the treaty, they should return and say so openly, before the Muslim army, however if they found that they were bent upon treachery, they should only inform him, so that the common Muslims would not be disheartened. On reaching there, the companions found the Banu Karatha, fully bent on mischief. They told the companions openly that there is no agreement, and no treaty between us and Muhammad. At this, 
they returned to the Islamic army and submitted their report to the Prophet, saying, Adil and Kara, that is, the Karatha are bent upon doing what the Adil and Kara had done with the preachers of Islam at Raji. This news spread among the Muslims and caused great consternation among them, for they had been encircled and their city had been endangered on the side where there existed no defensive arrangement, and where they had also sent their families to take shelter in the forts. This further increased the activities of the hypocrites, and they started making psychological attacks to break the morale of the Muslims. One said, How strange! We were being foretold that the lands of Caesar and Hosros would fall to us, but here we are, that not one of us can go out even to relieve himself. Another one asked for permission to leave his post at the trench, so that he could go and protect his own house, which was in danger. Another one started making secret propaganda, to the effect, Settle your affair with the invaders yourselves, and hand over Muhammad to them. This was a highly critical hour of trial, which exposed every person who harbored any hypocrisy in his heart. Only the true and sincere Muslims, remained firm and steadfast in their resolve and devotion. The Prophet at that critical moment, initiated peace negotiations with the Banu Ghatafan, and tried to persuade them to accept one-third of the fruit harvest of Medina and withdraw. However when he asked Sa'd bin Ubada, and Sa'd bin Mu'az, chief of the Ansar, for their opinion about the conditions of peace, they said, O oh, Messenger of God, is it your personal wish that we should agree on these conditions? Or is it God's command, that we have no option but to accept it? Or, are you giving this proposal, only in order to save us from the enemy? The Prophet replied, I am proposing this only to save you, I see that the whole of Arabia has formed a united front against you. I want to divide the enemy. At this the two chiefs protested, saying, if you want to conclude this pact for our sake, kindly forget it. These tribes could not subdue us under tribute, when we were polytheists. Now that we have the honor of believing in God and his messenger, will they make us sink to this depth of ignominy? The sword now shall be the arbiter, till God passes his judgment between them, and us. With these words, they tore up the draft for the treaty which had not yet been signed. In the meantime, Nu'aym bin Mas'ud, a member of the Ashia branch of the Ghatafan tribe, became a Muslim, and came before the Prophet and submitted. No one as yet, knows that I have embraced Islam. You can take from me whatever service you please. The Prophet replied. Go and sow the seeds of discord among the enemy. So first of all, Nu'aym went to the Karatha, with whom he was on friendly terms, and said to them. The Quraysh and the Ghatafan, can become wearied of the siege and go back, and they will lose nothing, but you have to live here with the Muslims. Just consider what will be your position, if the matter turns that way. Therefore, I would advise you not to join the enemy, until the outsiders should send some of their prominent men, as hostages to you. This had the desired effect upon the Banu Karatha and they decided to demand hostages from the united front of the tribes. Then he went to the chiefs of the Quraysh and the Ghatafan, and said to them, The Banu Quraytha seem to be slack and irresolute. Maybe they demand some men, as hostage from you, and then hand them over to Muhammad, to settle their affair with him. Therefore, be very firm and cautious in your dealing with them. This made the leaders of the united front suspicious of Banu Quraytha and they sent them a message, saying, We are tired of the long siege, let there be a decisive battle. Let us therefore, make a general assault simultaneously from both the sides. The Banu Karatha sent back the word, saying, We cannot afford to join the war, unless you hand over some of your prominent men to us as hostages. The leaders of the United Front, became convinced that what New Aim had said was true. They refused to send hostages, and the Banu Karatha, on the other side, also felt that New Aim had given them the correct counsel. Thus, the strategy worked, it divided the enemy against itself. 
The siege was prolonged for more than 25 days. It was winter. The supply of food and water and forage was becoming more and more scarce every day, and division in the camp was also a great strain on the state of morale of the besiegers. Then, suddenly one night, a severe windstorm accompanied by thunder and lightning hit the camp. It added to the cold and darkness. The wind overthrew the tents and put the enemy in disarray. They could not stand this severe blow of nature. They left the battleground even during the night, and returned to their homes. When the Muslims awoke in the morning, there was not a single enemy soldier to be seen on the battlefield. The Prophet, finding the battlefield completely empty, said, The Quraysh will never be able to attack you after this, now you will take the offensive. This was a correct assessment of the situation. Not only the Quraysh, but the united front of all the enemy tribes, had made their final assault against Islam and had failed. Now they could no longer dare invade Medina, now the Muslims were on the offensive. Social Reforms Though the period of two years between the battles of Uhud and the Trench was a period of disturbance and turmoil, and the Prophet and his companions could hardly relax in peace and security, even for a day, the work of reform as a whole, and the reconstruction of the Muslim society continued uninterrupted. This was the time when the Islamic laws pertaining to marriage and divorce were complemented, the law of inheritance was introduced, drinking and gambling were prohibited, and the new laws and regulations concerning many other aspects of the economic and social life were enforced. In this connection, an important thing that needed to be reformed was the question of the adoption of a son. Whoever was adopted by the Arabs as a son, was regarded as one of their own offspring, he got share in inheritance. He was treated like a real son, and real brother. By the adopted mother and the adopted sister, he could not marry the daughter of his adopted father, and his widow after his death. And the same was the case if the adopted son died, or divorced a wife. The adopted father regarded the woman as his real daughter-in-law. This custom clashed in every detail, with the laws of marriage, divorce, and inheritance, and joined by God in Surah 2, Al-Baqarah, and Surah 4, An-Nisa. It made a person who could get no share in inheritance, entitled to it, at the expense of those who were really entitled to it. It prohibited marriage, between the men and the women who could contract marriage, perfectly lawfully. And above all, it helped spread the immoralities, which the Islamic law wanted to eradicate. For a real mother, and a real sister, and a real daughter cannot be like the adopted mother, the adopted sister, and the adopted daughter, however one may try to sanctify the adopted relations as a custom. When the artificial relations endued with customary sanctity, are allowed to mix freely like the real relations, it cannot but produce evil results. That is why the Islamic law of marriage, divorce, the law of inheritance, and the law of the prohibition of adultery, required that the concept and custom of regarding the adopted son, as the real son, should be eradicated completely. This concept, however could not be rooted out by merely passing a legal order, saying the adopted son is not the real son. The centuries-old prejudices and superstitions, cannot be changed by mere word of mouth. Even if the people had accepted the command, that these relations were not the real relations, they would still have looked upon marriage between the adopted mother and the adopted son, the adopted brother and the sister, the adopted father and the daughter, and the adopted father-in-law, and the daughter-in-law loathsome and detestable. Moreover, there would still exist, some freedom of mixing together freely. Therefore, it was inevitable that the custom should be eradicated practically, and through the Prophet himself. For no Muslim could ever conceive, that a thing done by the Prophet himself, and done by him under God's command could be detestable. Therefore, a little before the Battle of the Trench, the Prophet was inspired by God, that he should marry the divorced wife of his adopted son Zaid bin Haritha, and he acted on this command during the siege of the Banu Karatha, 
which had immediately followed the Battle of the Trench. Storm of Propaganda at the Marriage of Zainab As soon as the marriage was contracted, there arose a storm of propaganda against the Prophet. The polytheists, the hypocrites, and the Jews, all were burning with jealousy at his triumphs, which followed one after the other. The way they had been humbled within two years after Uhud, in the Battle of the Trench, and in the affair of the Banu Karatha, had made them sore at heart. They had also lost hope, that they could ever subdue him on the battlefield. Therefore, they seized the question of this marriage as a godsend for themselves, and thought they would put an end to his moral superiority, which was the real secret of his power and success. Therefore stories were concocted, that Muhammad, God forbid, had fallen in love with his daughter-in-law, and when the son had come to know of this, he divorced his wife, and the father married his daughter-in-law. The propaganda, however, was absurd on the face of it. Zainab was the Prophet's first cousin. He had known her from childhood to youth. So there could be no question of his falling in love with her at first sight. Then he himself had arranged her marriage with Zaid under his personal influence, although her whole family had opposed it. They did not like, that a daughter of the noble Quraysh, should be given in marriage to a freed slave. Zainab herself was not happy at this arrangement. But everyone had to submit to the Prophet's command. The marriage was solemnized and a precedent was set in Arabia, that Islam had raised a freed slave to the status of the Quraysh nobility. If the Prophet had in reality any desire for Zainab, there was no need of marrying her to Zaid, he himself could have married her. In spite of all this, the shameless opponents invented stories of love, spread them with great exaggeration, and publicized them so vehemently, that even some Muslims also began to accept them as true. Preliminary Commandments of the Veil The fact that the tales invented by the enemies, also became topics of conversation among the Muslims, was a clear sign that the element of sensuality in society, had crossed all limits. If this illness had not been there, it was not possible that minds would have paid any attention whatsoever, to such absurd and disgusting stories about the Prophet. This was precisely the occasion, when the reformative commandments pertaining to the law of covering, hijab, were first enforced in the Islamic society. These reforms were introduced in the Surah, and complemented a year later in Surah 24, on Nur. For further details, see Introduction to Surah 24. Domestic Affairs of the Prophet There were two other problems which needed attention at that time. Though apparently, they pertained to the Prophet's domestic life. It was necessary to resolve them, for the domestic and mental peace of the person who was exerting every effort, to promote the cause of God's religion, and was, day and night, absorbed in this great mission. Therefore, God took these two problems also officially in his own hand. The first problem, was that economically the prophet at that time was in straitened circumstances. During the first four years, he had no source of income whatsoever. In four after Hijra, after the banishment of the Banu Nadhir, a portion of their evacuated lands, was reserved for his use by the command of God. But it was not enough for his family requirements. On the other hand, the duties of the office of prophethood were so onerous, that they were absorbing all his energies of the mind and body and heart, and every moment of his time, and he could not make any effort at all for earning his livelihood. In conditions such as these, when his wives happened to disturb his mental peace, because of economic hardships, he would feel doubly strained and taxed. The other problem was that before marrying Zainab, he had four wives already in the houses, Sauda, Aisha, Hafsa, and Umm Salama. Zainab was his fifth wife. At this the opponents raised the objection. The Muslims also started entertaining doubts, that is for others, it had been forbidden to keep more than four wives at a time. But how the Prophet himself had taken a fifth wife also. Subject Matter and Topics these were the questions that were engaging the attention of the Prophet and the Muslims. At the time Surah Al-Azab was revealed, 
and replies to the same, form the subject matter of this surah. A perusal of the theme in the background shows, that the surah is not a single discourse which was sent down in one piece, but it consists of several injunctions, commandments, and discourses. These were sent down one after the other, in connection with the important events of the time, and then were put together in one surah. Its following parts, stand out clearly distinguished from one another. Number 1. Verses 1 to 8, seem to have been sent down before the Battle of the Trench. Their perusal, keeping the historical background in view, shows that at the time of their revelation, Zaid had already divorced Zainab. The Prophet was feeling the necessity, that the concepts and customs and superstitions of ignorance, concerning the adoption of the Son, should be eradicated. And he was also feeling, that the delicate and deep sentiments, the people cherished about the adopted relations merely on emotional grounds, would not be rooted out, until he himself took the initiative, to eradicate the custom practically. At the same time, he was hesitant and considering seriously, that if he married the divorced wife of Zaid, then the hypocrites, the Jews, and the polytheists who were already bent on mischief, would get a fresh excuse to start a propaganda campaign against Islam. This was the occasion of the revelation of verses 1 to 8. Number 2. In verses 9 to 27, an appraisal has been made of the Battle of the Trench, and the raid against the Banu Karatha. This is a clear proof that these verses were sent down after these events. The discourse contained in verses 28, to 35, consists of two parts. In the first part, God has given a notice to the wives of the Prophet, who were being impatient of the straitened circumstances, to the effect. If you should desire the worldly life and its adornment, then come, I will provide for you, and give you a gracious release. However, if you should desire God, and his messenger, and the home of the hereafter, then indeed God has prepared for the doers of good among you, a great reward. Number 3. In the second part, initial steps were taken towards the social reforms, whose need was being felt by the minds molded in the Islamic pattern themselves. In this regard, reform was started from the house of the Prophet himself, and his wives were commanded, to avoid behaving and conducting themselves in the ways of the pre-Islamic days of ignorance, to remain in their houses with dignity, and to exercise great caution in their conversation, with the other men. This was the beginning of the commandments of the veil, hijab. Number 4. Verses 36, to 48, deal with the Prophet's marriage with Zainab. In this section, the opponent's objection about this marriage have been answered. The doubts that were being created in the minds of the Muslims have been removed. The Muslims have been acquainted with the Prophet's position and status, and the Prophet himself has been counseled, to exercise patience on the false propaganda of the disbelievers, and the hypocrites. Number 5. In verse 49, a clause of the law of divorce has been laid down. This is a unique verse which was sent down on some occasion, probably in connection with the same events. Number 6. In verses 50 to 52, a special regulation of marriage has been laid down for the Prophet, which points out that he is an exception to the several restrictions that have been imposed on the other Muslims in regard to marital life. Number 7. In verses 53, to 55, the second step was taken towards social reform. It consists of the following injunctions, restriction on the other men to visit the houses of the Prophet's wives, Islamic etiquette concerning visits and invitations, the law that only the near relatives could visit the wives in their houses. As for the other men, they could speak to or ask them a thing from behind a curtain, the injunction that the Prophet's wives were forbidden for the Muslims like their mothers, and none could marry any of them after him. Number 8. In verses 56, to 57, warning was given to stop criticizing the Prophet's marriage and his domestic life, and the believers instructed not to indulge in fault-finding, like the enemies of Islam, but to invoke the blessings of God for their Prophet. Moreover, 
They were instructed that they should avoid falsely accusing one another, even among themselves, not to speak of the person of the prophet. And finally, number 9. In verse 59, the third step for social reform was taken. All the Muslim women were commanded, that they should come out well covered with the outer garments, and covering their faces, whenever they came out of their houses for a genuine need. After this till the end of the surah, the hypocrites, and other foolish and mean people, have been rebuked for the propaganda that they were carrying on at that time, against Islam and the Muslims. Surah 33, Al-Azab. The Confederates or the Combined Forces, referring to the alliance of disbelieving Arab tribes, against the Muslims in Medina for the battle called, Al-Azab, or, Al-Handuk, the Trench. In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. O Prophet, fear God and do not obey the disbelievers and the hypocrites. Indeed God, is ever knowing and wise. And follow that which is revealed to you, from your Lord. Indeed God is ever, with what you do, acquainted. And rely upon God, and sufficient is God as disposer of affairs. God has not made for a man two hearts in his interior. And he has not made your wives whom you declare unlawful, your mothers. By the expression, you are to me like the back of my mother. Such an oath taken against approaching one's wife was a pre-Islamic practice, declared by God to be a sin, requiring expiation, as described in Surah 58, verse 3 and 4. And he has not made your claimed adopted sons, your true sons. That is merely your saying by your mouths. But God says the truth, and he guides to the right way. Call them. Those children under your care. By the names of their fathers, it is more just in the sight of God. But if you do not know their fathers, then they are still your brothers in religion, and those entrusted to you. And there is no blame upon you, for that in which you have erred, but only for what your hearts intended. And ever is God forgiving and merciful. The Prophet is more worthy of the believers, than themselves. He is more worthy of their obedience and loyalty, and is more concerned for them, than they are for one another. And his wives are in the position of their mothers. And those of blood relationship are more entitled to inheritance, in the decree of God, than the other believers and the emigrants, except that you may do to your close associates, a kindness through bequest. That was in the book. The Preserved Slate, Allah al mahfuz Inscribed. And mention O Muhammad, when we took from the prophets their covenant, and from you, and from Noah, and Abraham, and Moses, and Jesus, the son of Mary, and we took from them a solemn covenant, that he may question the truthful about their truth. Meaning, that he may ask the prophets, what they conveyed to their people, and what response they received. The truthful may also refer to those who believed in the message conveyed by the prophets, and imparted it to others. And he has prepared for the disbelievers a painful punishment. O oh you, who have believed, remember the favor of God upon you. When armies came to attack you, and we sent upon them a wind, and armies of angels you did not see. And ever is God, of what you do, seeing. Remember when they came at you from above you and from below you, and when eyes shifted in fear, and hearts reached the throats, and you assumed about God various assumptions. There the believers were tested and shaken, with a severe shaking. And remember when the hypocrites and those in whose hearts is disease, said, God and his messenger did not promise us except illusion. And one a faction of them said, O people of Yathrib. The name by which Medina was known, before the arrival of the Prophet. There is no stability for you here, so return home. And a party of them asked permission of the Prophet, saying, Indeed our houses are exposed, unprotected, while they were not exposed. They did not intend except to flee. And if they had been entered upon, from all its surrounding regions and fitna, disbelief, had been demanded of them, they would have done it, and not hesitated over it, except briefly. And they had already promised God before, 
not to turn their backs, flee. And ever is the promise to God, that about which one will be questioned. Say O Muhammad, never will fleeing benefit you, if you should flee from death or killing, and then if you did, you would not be given enjoyment of life, except for a little. Say, who is it that can protect you from God? Meaning, prevent the will of God from being carried out. If he intends for you an ill, or intends for you a mercy? And they will not find for themselves besides God, any protector or any helper. Already God knows the hinderers. Those who dissuade others, from supporting the prophet in battle. Among you, and those hypocrites who say to their brothers, come to us. Rather than joining the prophet. And do not go to battle, except for a few. Who went out of ulterior motives. Being niggardly toward you. Literally. Stingy. Meaning unwilling to offer any help. And when fear comes, you see them looking at you, their eyes revolving like one being overcome by death. But when fear departs, they lash you with sharp tongues, indisposed toward any good. Those have not believed, so God has rendered their deeds worthless, and ever is that for God, easy. They think the companies have not yet withdrawn. In their excessive fear, the cowardly hypocrites could not believe the enemy forces had been defeated. And if the companies should come again, they would wish they were in the desert among the Bedouins, inquiring from afar, about your news. And if they should be among you, they would not fight except for a little. There has certainly been for you, in the messenger of God an excellent model. An example to be followed. For anyone whose hope is in God in the last day, and who remembers God often. And when the believers saw the confederates, they said, this is what God and his messenger had promised us, and God and his messenger spoke the truth. And it increased them only in faith and submission. Among the believers are men true to what they promise God. Among them is he, who has fulfilled his vow, by attaining martyrdom, and among them is he, who awaits his chance. And they did not alter the terms of their commitment by any alteration. That God may reward the truthful for their truth and punish the hypocrites if he wills, or accept their repentance. Indeed God is ever forgiving and merciful. And God repelled those who disbelieved. In their rage. Not having obtained any good. And sufficient was God for the believers in battle. And ever is God powerful and exalted in might. And he brought down those who supported them among the people of the book. The Jews, of Banu Karatha who had violated their treaty with the Muslims, from their fortresses, and cast terror into their hearts, so that a party, their men, you killed, and you took captive a party, the women and children, and he caused you to inherit their land, and their homes, and their properties, and a land which you have not trodden, meaning, that taken in subsequent conquests, and ever is God, over all things, competent. O Prophet, say to your wives, if you should desire the worldly life and its adornment, then come, I will provide for you and give you a gracious release. But if you should desire God and his messenger, and the home of the hereafter, then indeed God has prepared for the doers of good among you, a great reward. O wives of the Prophet, whoever of you should commit a clear immorality, for her the punishment would be doubled twofold, and ever is that for God, easy. And whoever of you devoutly obeys God and his messenger, and his righteousness, we will give her, her reward twice, and we have prepared for her a noble provision. O wives of the prophet, you are not like anyone among women. If you fear God, then do not be soft in speech to men. The meaning has also been given as, you are not like any among women, if you fear God. So do not be soft in speech, lest he in whose heart is disease, should covet, but speak with appropriate speech. And abide in your houses and do not display yourselves, as was the display of the former times of ignorance. And establish prayer and give zakat, and obey God and his messenger. God intends only to remove from you the impurity of sin, O people of the prophet's household and to purify you with extensive purification. 
and remember what is recited in your houses of the verses of God, and wisdom. The teachings of the Prophet, or his Sunnah, sayings and practices. Indeed God is ever subtle, and acquainted with all things. Indeed the Muslim men and Muslim women, the believing men and believing women, the obedient men and obedient women, the truthful men and truthful women, the patient men and patient women, the humble men and humble women, the charitable men and charitable women, the fasting men and fasting women, the men who guard their private parts and the women who do so, and the men who remember God often, and the women who do so, for them God has prepared forgiveness, and a great reward. It is not for a believing man or a believing woman, when God and his messenger have decided a matter, that they should thereafter have any choice about their affair. And whoever disobeys God and his messenger, has certainly strayed into clear error. And remember O Muhammad, when you said to the one on whom God bestowed favor, and you bestowed favor. Referring to the Prophet's freed slave, Zaid bin Haritha. Keep your wife and fear God while you concealed within yourself that which God is to disclose. Meaning, God's command to the Prophet to marry Zainab, after Zaid divorced her. This was to demonstrate that a man may marry a woman, formerly married to his adopted son. And you feared the people. Meaning, feared their saying, that the Prophet had married the former wife of his son, which is prohibited by God, in the case of a true begotten son while God has more right that you fear him, by making known his command. So when Zaid had no longer any need for her, we married her to you, in order that there not be upon the believers any discomfort, meaning guilt, concerning the wives of their claimed adopted sons, when they no longer have need of them, and ever is the command, decree, of God accomplished. There is not to be upon the prophet, any discomfort concerning that which God has imposed upon him, or permitted to him. This is the established way of God, with those prophets who have passed on before. And ever is the command of God a destiny decreed. God praises those who convey the messages of God. Meaning, the prophets, peace be upon them all. And after them the followers of the final prophet Muhammad, who honestly convey God's message to the people and fear him and do not fear anyone but God. And sufficient is God as accountant. Muhammad is not the father of any one of your men. But he is the messenger of God, and seal, last of the prophets. And ever is God, of all things, knowing. O you, who have believed, remember God with much remembrance, and exalt him morning and afternoon. It is he, who confers blessing upon you. Meaning, God cares for you and covers you with his mercy. An additional meaning is, that he praises you in the presence of the angels. And his angels ask him to do so, that he may bring you out from darknesses into the light. And ever is he, to the believers, merciful. Their greeting the day they meet him will be, peace. And he has prepared for them a noble reward. O Prophet, indeed we have sent you as a witness and a bringer of good tidings, and a warner and one who invites to God, by his permission, and an illuminating lamp. And give good tidings to the believers that they will have from God great bounty. And do not obey the disbelievers and the hypocrites, but do not harm them, and rely upon God. And sufficient is God as disposer of affairs. O you, who have believed, when you marry believing women, and then divorce them before you have touched them. Consummated the marriage. Then there is not for you, any waiting period to count concerning them. So provide for them and give them a gracious release. O Prophet, indeed we have made lawful to you, your wives to whom you have given their due compensation. Meaning bridal gifts, my her. And those your right hand possesses from what God has returned to you of captives, and the daughters of your paternal uncles, and the daughters of your paternal aunts, and the daughters of your maternal uncles and the daughters of your maternal aunts who emigrated with you, and a believing woman if she gives herself to the Prophet, and if the Prophet wishes to marry her, this is only for you, excluding the other believers. We certainly know what we have made obligatory upon them, concerning their wives, 
and those their right hands possess. But this is for you, in order that there will be upon you, no discomfort, difficulty, and ever is God forgiving and merciful. You O Muhammad, may put aside whom you will of them. Those mentioned in the previous verse, as being lawful to the Prophet, or his wives to which he was married, or take to yourself whom you will, and any that you desire of those wives, from whom you had temporarily separated, there is no blame upon you in returning her, that is more suitable that they should be content and not grieve, and that they should be satisfied with what you have given them, all of them, and God knows what is in your hearts, and ever is God knowing and forbearing, not lawful to you O Muhammad, are any additional women after this, nor is it for you to exchange them for other wives, even if their beauty were to please you, except what your right hand possesses. And ever is God, over all things, an observer. O you, who have believed, do not enter the houses of the Prophet, except when you are permitted for a meal, without awaiting its readiness. But when you are invited, then enter, and when you have eaten, disperse without seeking to remain for conversation. Indeed that behavior was troubling the Prophet, and he is shy of dismissing you. But God is not shy of the truth. And when you ask his wives for something, ask them from behind a partition. That is pure for your hearts, and their hearts. And it is not conceivable, or lawful for you, to harm the messenger of God, or to marry his wives after him, ever. Indeed that would be in the sight of God an enormity. Whether you reveal a thing or conceal it, indeed God is ever, of all things, knowing. There is no blame upon them. Women. Concerning their fathers or their sons, or their brothers or their brothers' sons, or their sisters' sons or their women, or those their right hands possess, slaves. It is permissible for a woman to appear before these people, without complete covering and to be alone with them. The brothers of both parents' uncles are included as fathers, or parents, according to Hadith, and fear God. Indeed God is ever, over all things, witness. Indeed God confers blessing upon the Prophet, and his angels ask him to do so. O you, who have believed, ask God to confer blessing upon him, and ask God to grant him peace. Indeed those who abuse God and his messenger, God has cursed them in this world and the hereafter, and prepared for them a humiliating punishment. And those who harm believing men and believing women, for something other than what they have earned, deserved, have certainly borne upon themselves a slander and manifest sin. O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the women of the believers, to bring down over themselves part of their outer garments. The jilbab, which is defined as a cloak, covering the head and reaching to the ground, thereby covering the woman's entire body, that is more suitable that they will be known, as chaste believing women, and not be abused, and ever as God forgiving and merciful, or, and God was forgiving and merciful, of what occurred before this injunction or before knowledge of it, if the hypocrites and those in whose hearts is disease, referring here to those who commit adultery, or fornication. And those who spread rumors in Al-Medina do not cease. We will surely incite you against them, then they will not remain your neighbors therein, except for a little. Accursed wherever they are found, being seized and massacred completely. This is the established way of God with those who passed on before, and you will not find in the way of God any change. People ask you concerning the hour. Say, knowledge of it is only with God. And what will make you realize, maybe the hour is close. Indeed God has cursed the disbelievers and prepared for them a blaze. Abiding therein, forever, they will not find a protector or a helper. The day their faces will be turned about in the fire, they will say, how we wish we had obeyed God and obeyed the messenger. And they will say, our Lord, indeed we obeyed our leaders and our great men, also interpreted to mean, our noble ones, and our elders, meaning distinguished scholars, and they led us astray, from the right way, our Lord, give them double the punishment and curse them with a great curse, 
O you, who have believed, be not like those who harmed Moses, then God cleared him of what they said. And he was highly distinguished with God. O you, who have believed, fear God and speak words of appropriate justice. He will then amend for you your deeds and forgive you your sins. And whoever obeys God and his messenger has certainly attained a great attainment. Indeed we offered the trust, the acceptance of obligations, and obedience to God, to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, and they declined to bear it and shrank from it, but the human being undertook to bear it. Indeed he was unjust, and ignorant, coveting its reward, while forgetting the penalty for failure to keep his commitment. It, the reason for which mankind was permitted to carry the trust, was so that God may punish the hypocrite men and hypocrite women, and the men and women who associate others with him, and that God may accept repentance from the believing men and believing women. And ever is God forgiving and merciful. Thank you, for listening. If you have enjoyed listening to this book, please give it a like, and consider subscribing to the channel, and click the notifications button, so you don't miss out, on any other videos.